chapter four, Sensation and Perception. And our textbook is Introduction to Psychologists. To psychologists. Psychology. It's my fourth video today, so I'm all brain dead. Psychology, 12th edition, James Collat. Okay, we are going to be talking about sensation and perception. Essentially, that means how the different senses work. That is sensation. Perception refers to, and this is the more interesting thing psychologically, there's more kind of meat on this bone. The other stuff is sort of basic science, nuts and bolts, how these different neurons work and how they transmit information to the brain. Perception is what our brain does with that information, how our brain turns signals from our eyes and our ears and our skin and different uh, senses into a picture of reality. So kind of, we'll kind of go quickly through the sensation stuff. I will post some videos below because I'll do a better job of explaining some of these concepts than I can. Um, I have animations and such like that, that uh, than just me talking about these things. So that will be uh, how we'll handle most of the sensation stuff. I will run through the slides, but you may learn more from the subsequent videos in the feed. And then we'll talk a bit about perception because uh, perception is some of the interesting stuff that happens in this process. Let's do this. All right, let's just, we're going to skip the objectives. There's too many of them. We don't need to read them all. We will find out about them soon enough. And slash unit one of this chapter is vision. This is one of the most important senses, if not the most important for humans. For many animals, it is smell. For humans, it is vision. All right, so vision occurs when light strikes the retina at the back of the eye, causing cells to send messages to the brain. And Point of fact is that our eyes are actually part of our nervous system, only exposed part. Okay, stimulus, energy from around the world that affects us in some way. Receptors, specialized cells that convert environmental energies into signals for the nervous system. So uh, basic type of receptors we have, probably should be on this early slide, but that's okay. We've got uh, mechanoreceptors, We've got chemoreceptors and we've got photoreceptors. Photoreceptors detect light energy. Chemoreceptors detect chemical energy in the air or chemicals in the air or in our food. And so chemoreceptors are in our nose and our mouth. Mechano, uh, photoreceptors obviously our eyes. The mechanoreceptors are our ears our skin and also all the different cells that are in our joints and different parts of our body that can sense motion. Okay, so photoreceptors, they are detecting light, uh, detecting this electrical uh, magnetic spectrum, not all light, but some of it we can detect. All right, let's look at this structure of this eye here. Again, the videos may be more helpful, but we've got a retina. This here is our retina, layer of visual receptors covering the back surface of the eyeball. We do have a blind spot. That's where the optic nerve goes back. So the blind spot is here because there are no um, visual receptors there in that particular spot. Cornea, rigid structure, rigid structure that always focuses light in the same way. Cornea here. Lens, a flexible structure that enables accommodation. Right, lens here. Fovea adapted for detailed vision over here. All right, this is our blind spot. Okay, so when we're talking about visual receptors, we are talking about rods and cones. Let's minus this a little bit. Cones are adapted for perceiving color and detail in bright light. Rods are adapted for vision in dim light. They respond to faint stimulation and pull resources to send messages to bipolar cells. So we've got our cones here and our rods here. Cones responsible for color. Dark adaptation is a gradual improvement in the ability to see in dim lights. Cones and rods adapt at different rates. Decrease in intensity of light indicates increased sensitivity of your eyes. This shows the increasing sensitivity over time with uh, minimal detection of intensity of light. Minimal detectable intensity of light 
you get increasing sensitivity over time and then a further increase in uh, sensitivity due to rod activity, right? The visual pathway, here we have a brain. It's a little hard to see in this diagram, but we see this eyeball is sending information through this corpus callosum to the opposite backside, the occipital lobe, where that information is processed there. This eye is sending information to the other occipital lobe in the opposite hemisphere. Bipolar cells contact ganglion cells, axons from ganglion cells join to form the optic nerve. Blind spot, the part of the retina that has no receptors because exiting axons take up all the space. Color vision is how the visual system converts wavelengths of light into perception of color. So this may come as a surprise to you, but color does not really exist in the universe. Objects are not colored. Color exists in here. Our brain uh, makes it up. Our, the color is our brain's interpretation of the uh, spectrum of light, right? Really, these are just energy frequencies, and our brain uh, turns them into this fantastic psychedelic experience that we have, which is kind of fascinating. Okay. Uh, so we've got a few theories of color. We've got the young Heimlitz or Heimholtz uh, trichromatic theory says that color vision depends on the rel relative rate of response of the three types of cones. We've got the opponent process theory, which says that color perceived and is perceived in paired opposites: red versus green, yellow blue, white black. Negative after images are experiences of one color after the removal of another. We've got the retinex theory. What you see depends on contrast with objects around it, brightness contrast, and color constancy. Uh, so we have essentially color blindness or color vision deficiency. Complete color blindness is rare, but some people have trouble uh, seeing what's happening here. So for those who are not color blind, you will see some green dots in the middle here in the shape of a 74. Here you'll see some red dots, reddish dots in the shape of an eight. For those that are colorblind, you may not be able to see those colors in the middle of the circle. Unit two, non-visual senses. All right, hearing, one of two. Okay, so our sound is these little things here, uh, down waves, and they, so what's inside our ear is a form of pressure detection, right? Mechano, there are types of mechanoreceptors. Those sound waves, that energy moving through the air, right? Air is a collection of particles, oxygen, uh, various other gases and things like that are floating around in the atmosphere. They move as energy moves through them and that energy can capture some of that energy. We have little tiny hairs that vibrate in response to that energy. And that is how our brains uh, sound. So sound waves are vibrations in the air, water, or other medium. They vary in frequency and amplitude. Hertz refers to the frequency of the sound wave or the vibrations per second. Pitch, we hear high frequency sound waves as high pitches and low frequency as low pitches. Loudness, perception of the intensity of the sound waves. And timbre, tone complexity. So these are essentially the different elements of sound that our ears can pick up on and our brains can interpret. Uh, the cochlea is the internal part of our brain, contains the receptors for hearing. Deafness occurs when bones connected to the eardrum cannot transmit sound waves to the cochlea. Nerve deafness occurs from damage to the cochlea, hair cells, or auditory nerves. Sound goes in, it bounces around in here. There are little hairs that then vibrate and nerve cells are connected to those hairs, which send signals to our brain. That is a very simplistic explanation, but that's the gist of it. Pitch perception, frequency principle, sound wave through the fluid of the cochlea vibrates the hair cells, which produce action potentials in synchrony with the sound waves. A volley principle, groups or volleys of hair spells respond to each vibration with an action potential. The place potential, place principle, is so that the highest frequency sounds vibrate hair cells near the stirrup end and the lower frequency, about one to 200 hertz, vibrate hair cells 
at points further along the membrane. Here we've got uh, illustrations of frequency, volleys, and place. We've got a sort of depiction of the cochlea with the hair cells, the basilar membrane. Vestibular sense. So this is also part of our ear and is related to balance. It's why you feel dizzy if you spin around. Maybe you did that when you were a little kid, spin around in circles, you will start to feel dizzy. You're basically getting that uh, air swirling around and making you feel off balance. It can be kind of a fun sensation or a nauseating one, depending on your age. Actually, our vestibular sense detects the tilt and acceleration of the head and the orientation of the head with respect to gravity plays a key role in posture and balance, is responsible for motion sickness, enables you to keep your eyes fixated on a target as your head moves. So if we're fighting, for example, we're moving our head side to side, we want to still be looking at some part of that person's body. We don't want our frame of vision to be uh, all around, right? We want a steady image as we move our body. And our vestibular sense allows us to do that. Yay. <clears throat> okay. The cutaneous senses. The skin sense, also known as the somatosensory system. Part of that is pain, which is a mixture of bodily sensation and emotional reaction, which depend on different brain areas. Gate theory of pain. Pain messages must pass through a gate, presumably in the spinal cord, that can block messages. Ways to decrease pain. Distraction. Endorphins are neurotransmitters that weaken pain sensation. So maybe you're running a long distance, your, your legs are hurting, but the endorphins kick in, you keep going. Uh, capsaicin is uh, the chemical in hot peppers. It can stimulate uh, receptors that respond to painful heat. Taste. Our sensory system detects chemicals on our tongue. And this in particular, our taste buds do that. They are a fold on the surface of the tongue that holds our taste receptors. We have taste receptors for sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. Umami is the flavor, uh, the sort of protein, proteiny sort of richness. Uh, where humans are actually really good at detecting the amount of calories in food. We can uh, pretty accurately tell which foods have more calories than others. One thing you'll notice is missing here is uh, hot. We don't actually have a taste receptor for hot, but the chemicals and peppers, they burn our nerves. So that feeling of hot food is really just those nerves in pain. But we like pain sometimes. Olfaction or smell. Olfaction is the sense of smell. Olfactory receptors detect airborne molecules. Humans have hundreds of types of olfactory receptors. Many odors produce strong emotional responses. So chin is actually the sense that is most directly sort of connected with the emotion centers of our brain. And that's because emotion centers of the brain are very old as are uh, olfactory and olfaction, right? That was some of the earliest ways that animals used and things that predated animals, insects and such used to get around yourself down by smelling a scent like lavender, for example. Um, that can be one useful strategy to conversation. Uh, Olfaction serves important social functions in most non-human animals. Uh, so most non-human animals will uh, learn things. You know, am I related to this other animal? Is this animal a good animal for me to mate with? Is it dangerous? They can do all kinds of fancy cool things with their noses. Interestingly, uh, animals can also do some interesting things with their noses. Mostly uh, animals of the female variety, they can actually judge the attractiveness of a male by smelling their sweaty t-shirts. But the key is they can only do this uh, when they are ovulating, when they're ready to, when their body's ready to make a baby, they get the special superpower of being able to know who is a good person to make a baby with based on how they smell. That would be a good example of evolutionary psychology. Okay. Olfaction is more important to our social behavior than generally acknowledged. Olfactory receptor cells lining the nasal cavity send information to the olfactory bulb in the brain. Of all the senses, 
uh, here we have the most direct connection from the olfactory uh, neurons to the olfactory uh, receptor cells. And in smell, some people have three times as many taste buds as others. More taste buds indicate more intense taste experiences. Right, so even something as simple as taste or sight or sound, the ability to hear these things, how intense they feel to us can be very different. Some people might walk into a room and be extremely overwhelmed by the sounds. Some people might have a meal and be able to appreciate all the subtle flavors in it. Other people may not really, it's just a meal. It's no real different than anything else. Um, so in a lot of ways, we experience the world in fundamentally different and interesting ways. More taste buds indicate stronger food likes and dislikes. More taste buds generally indicate dislike for strong or highly spiced foods. People vary in their genes for olfactory receptors, causing certain odors to seem stronger. Women tend to be more sensitive to odors than men. It seems to be evolutionary. Uh, men also have stronger body odor, so that probably evolved in men along with women's ability to detect things about men with their body odor. <clears throat> Sensitivity declines in old age for some odors. Okay, onward and upward. Synesthesia is a condition in which a stimulus of one type, such as a sound, also elicits an, another experience, such as color. So this is interesting and fascinating. Most of us don't really know what this is or can't really imagine it, but imagine if when you hear a particular musical note <clears throat> played on a piano, you see a color. Maybe you hear someone playing a piano piece and now there's colors flashing at you. That sounds really cool. I don't know what that's like, but uh, sounds, but maybe also sounds like it could be difficult. Okay. Unit three, interpreting sensory information. So I think here for me, this is where stuff gets more interesting because <clears throat> there's a lot of interesting stuff going on psychologically. Interpret information. We're all to a certain extent exposed to similar information. How we interpret it has a great deal with our current state, our current mood, the current set of concepts we are working on, right? Our brain is constantly trying to understand the world around us, trying to figure things out. And it's having to sort of pull pieces together to create a coherent whole. Sometimes it does a good job of that. Sometimes it does less so of a good job at that. Uh, but either way, there's always interesting stuff in how we perceive the world, right? And is really kind of limited, you might say. Like most of our beliefs are drawn not, I should say sensation is limited. Most of our beliefs and our experience and our mood and all that stuff throughout the day isn't based on a perception, right? Say we go to work and we go to our job and we're unhappy. It's not it could be have to do with a, a sensation that we're having, like there's something physically uncomfortable, but a lot of it has to do with our perception of the job. You know, what do we think when we see, you know, maybe we were have to work at McDonald's and we see the M, right? We drive into work, we see the M. Now that's a sensation, but what do we perceive? Maybe we perceive failure. Maybe we think we should be a job that is more prestigious or pays more money. <clears throat> or maybe we perceive you know, being grateful to have a job and being grateful to have uh, some way to support ourselves and move forward in our life, right? So per, a lot of our experience is determined not by our sensation, but by our perception. So let's talk about some of the nuts and bolts of perception. <clears throat> Perceiving minimal stimuli. So there's something called a just noticeable difference, and that is the smallest difference that people can detect between one stimulus and another. So you say you have two lights, one is slightly brighter, the just noticeable difference is how much it takes to how much brighter you have to make one light than the other to make it perceptible. Weber's law says that a just noticeable difference is a constant fraction of the original stimulus. So essentially what that means is if two lights are very dim, very, very, just barely visible, a small increase in one will be noticeable in the other. But if two lights are extremely bright, a small increase in one will not be noticeable sensory thresholds and signal detection. An absolute sensory threshold is the intensity at which a stimulus is detected 50% of the time. So, you know, say there's a person on a road, you know, five miles away or whatever. I don't know what the absolute sensory threshold is for a person in a clear day and a flat ground. Um, the distance at which you can 
see that person 50% of the time is the absolute sensory threshold. Signal detection theory is the study of people's tendency to make hits, that's correct guesses, correct rejections, misses, and false alarms. Response depends on willingness to risk misses or false alarms. When trying to detect an item, we are more likely to overlook it if it occurs. Okay, interesting topic, subliminal perception. A lot of psychology studies do make use of this, uh, so it's worth understanding. The phenomenon that a stimulus can influence a behavior even when it is presented so faintly or briefly that the observer has no conscious perception of it. So advertising could be something like this. You go to the movie theater um, and they flash the word popcorn on the screen for 100 milliseconds. Now that is 100 milliseconds is a one tenth of a second. That is not going to be quick enough for your conscious brain to notice. You are not going to realize that they flashed the word popcorn on the screen. But all of a sudden you start thinking, maybe I should go get some popcorn. And then before you know it, you're getting up to get some popcorn. Not allow for others to control our thoughts and habits through suggestions or improve memory. Well, it doesn't allow them to control. It's not like they can say buy popcorn and you're just absolutely going to do it. If you are following a strict diet and you're determined to not buy popcorn, you're not going to be affected. But if you're on the fence and you are already like, oh man, I should have got some popcorn. I'm, why didn't I get popcorn? Then that clue comes on the screen, that reminder, it, it might be the kind of straw that breaks the camel's back for you, and nudges you towards doing that. Um, you know, there's always a struggle in our brain, right? There's parts of our brain that are saying, get the popcorn, get the popcorn, get the popcorn. And then there's other parts of our brain that are saying, don't get the popcorn. Uh, you know, people will judge you for eating, or you'll get fat, or it's not healthy, or this or that, or I don't have the money, right? So there's always these competing narratives, kind of competing impulses in our brain. And the action that we end up doing is the one in which there's sort of, that sort of wins out. There's all these like kind of competing voices and then one sort of rises to the top and that's the action. So a subliminal message can sort of strengthen one of those unconscious kind of urges and maybe allow it to win over. Studies in terror management theory, when you subliminally flash the word death to people, it uh, creates a lot of anxiety for them and affects their behavior in profound ways. So that is interesting stuff that we will get to later. Feature detection approach. Feature detector is a specialized neuron in the visual cortex that responds to the presence of simple features, such as lines and angles, right? So this is not a circle, but and the actual sensation is a bunch of curved lines, right? But what do we perceive? We perceive a circle, right? These, these are not squares, really. They're a bunch of vertical lines, but because of the way they're arranged, we perceive them as squares, etc. cetera. Uh, do feature detectors explain perception? Well, to some extent, but they don't completely perceive it. Feature detectors cannot completely explain how we perceive letters or faces, context, determines our perception, All right? So we all read this as the cat in the hat, but that's because we are familiar with the title of that book, not because that's what it actually says. A gestalt psychology emphasizes perception of overall patterns. Um, so essentially this means we tend to perceive things as a whole rather than individual parts. A useful uh, terminology, pretty important when we're talking about sensation and perception is bottom up versus top down. So bottom up perception is perceptual activity in which tiny elements combine to produce larger items. Top down processes is ex applying experience and expectations to interpret each item. So when we look at this slide and we read cat in the hat, that is an example of top down. We're imposing a certain structure, a certain set of con concepts onto the physical world. And that's always the case. There's always an element of top-down processing. We go into the world, every time we step out into the world, we have a set of concepts and we are filtering the sensory information through our set of concepts, through our expectations, through our beliefs. Okay, figure and ground, which refers to sort of just object versus the background and reversible figures can be perceived in more than one way. So Gestalt principles of uh, psychology, uh, things like proximity, similarity, continuation, closure, and good figure. 
of different sort of ways in which um, perception works. It's kind of different features of perception. There are some similarities between vision and hearing. Perceptual organization principles of gestalt psychology, you know, in terms of like, you know, the squiggly lines looking like a circle, that also applies to hearing. We hear certain things. If we expect to hear a certain thing, we're going to hear it a certain way. You know, baby may just be making noises, but we hear that as mommy or daddy or whatever. Gestalt principles of continuation and closure work best when one item interrupts something else. Okay, movement and depth. So, you know, our eyes are really just perceiving blotches of color when we perceive depth. Right now I'm looking at my computer screen, but I'm looking at the window behind that and the trees out in the forest. I'm seeing one object in front of the other, but really the only thing that's coming into my brain are splotches of color. Everything else is being added by my brain. My brain has learned that if one thing is in front of the other, that means there's some depth. My brain has learned to figure out what's moving relative to others through various uh, forms of experience, right? So uh, I'll mention a William James quote here. And he said to, remember, he was your kind of one of the first American psychologists, uh, the perception maybe is his book. <clears throat> in the late 1800s or principles of psychology, I forget. This is a phrase, blooming, buzzing confusion to refer to, oh, excuse me, to refer to the world, right? So the newborn infant comes into the world and there's just, there's color, there's sound, there's just, it's a kind of constant stream of sensory information. Over time, the infant starts to associate certain patterns of color with a certain voice and start to say, oh, this is my mom. These are the patterns of color associated with her. This is the sounds associated with her. These are the feelings associated with her. Same for my dad, same for my dog, my cat, my room, my this, my that. Right? Gradually, we start to use concepts to organize the sensory information. We start to figure out that, you know, it's not just random swirls, but that there's patterns that things are moving in a particular way, according to certain laws, etc. Okay, so perception, perceiving an object as moving if it moves relative to its background, the clues in terms of depth, like retinal disparity and convergence, monocular clues like object size, linear perspective, and interposition. So you can kind of use all these when drawing, for example, you learn how to create a three-dimensional uh, picture or a picture that looks like it has depth um, using certain clues. Okay. Getting towards the end here, optical illusions are misrepresentations of visual stimulus, occur based on misjudging distance. Many two-dimensional drawings offer misleading depth clues. In the moon illusion, the moon at the horizon appears 30% larger than when it's high in the sky to most people. The moon is actually not larger when it's coming up on the horizon than when it is in the, the top of the sky. It's just our brain, to our brains, it looks larger because it's near the tree line or a mountain. And there's nothing to compare it to when it's up in the sky, but it's actually the same size, right? So it's just an optical illusion. I will post a video that has a lot more optical illusions and also a video about uh, sensation and perception. So really about perception. That's pretty important. So be sure to watch those. Uh, in small group, okay, skip the discussion, skip the summary. Okay, that was our discussion of sensation and perception. As I said, I will post a couple videos after this. Please be sure to watch those, especially the one on perception. It's pretty important, so I encourage you to watch it. All right, I'll talk to you all soon.